Uh, thank you, uh, Patricia. Good to see all of you. Uh, as Patricia said, uh, I'm now at NORAD. I used to be a conflict uh, researcher for many years. Um, it was actually a little bit nice to see, even though I jumped the academic ship uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, my previous career lives on in some of the uh, citations on, the, on some, of the, uh, some of the slides. So, gone but not forgotten, or whatever. Uh, anyway, it was, a, uh, it was a privilege to sit here and listen to these uh, three uh, presentations. Extremely important topics, extremely timely uh, topics. So, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not going to try to summarize it or anything. I'll, I think I'll leave you with a, a set of, of comments, you know, slash questions uh, that I think might be useful uh, taking this uh, forward. Some of it related to uh, policy, uh, some of it more, more related to the, to the research side. But I think I want to actually start by emphasizing the point uh, that Anna also brought up, and that's this shift uh, that we're seeing in basically where in the world you find um, the extreme poor. Right? So uh, Anna used the, uh, the figure 59% of extreme poor might live in, uh, in conflict and fragile settings in, in 2030. I've actually seen a, a World Bank estimate uh, that might be updated as, as close to two thirds uh, of all extremely poor will live in conflict and fragile settings in, in, two -thirds, in, in 2030. And I, I think it's important that we realize how big of a change uh, that is for the development community, right? So if you go back to 2000, 20% uh, of all extreme poor uh, lived in conflict settings. That means that 80% of the extreme poor lived in poor but otherwise stable countries. Um, these are the countries basically that uh, development agencies have the most expertise working in, right? Those are the Indonesias, the Ghanas, the Tanzanias, the Indias uh, of the world. Going forward, when your primary mission is to, uh, is to reduce poverty, the types of countries that you're working in is going to shift, and the types of contexts that you're working in is going to shift. And this, this research uh, on this topic, basically, is going to be absolutely crucial uh, for that. So the word or the term, uh, uh, the jar jargon for this in development circles is nexus, right? You have this nexus uh, between uh, development, humanitarian work, and peace and reconciliation. I'm not a super fan of that term, but anyway, that's the, that's the, that's the term that is used. What it basically means, right, is that you don't have these, we don't, you, you, we don't live in a world anymore where you have a set of countries where you have uh, long-term development activity, uh, <coughs> basically what used to be the UNDP countries, and a set of countries uh, where you do peace and reconciliation, which used to be the Department of Political Affairs countries, uh, and the humanitarian relief uh, refugee countries, which used to be the UNHCR countries. Now, increasingly, uh, those countries are all the same, uh, and that means that we actually have to think quite differently uh, about how we handle all of these nexus-type questions. And then a lot of the nexus discussion still, right, is centered around how do you integrate, um, uh, how do you integrate and basically force long-term development actors and humanitarian development actors uh, to work more effectively and efficiently uh, alongside each other. What that discussion and that debate uh, misses out on, and what I think many of these papers highlight very eloquently, uh, is um, the uh, third uh, corner of this triangle, and that is the peace and reconciliation part of it, right? How do we do peace building, uh, how does the conflict process, the conflict dynamics influence uh, long-term development? That's areas where uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I think I can say with some authority that uh, uh, the research has come much further uh, than where we see the, the, um, the policy thinking on these topics have, 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 have gotten. And I think it's, you know, so, there's some obvious things here to flesh out, right? So one thing is, you know, how does, um, um, how, how does the, how is the post-conflict setting influenced by the conflict dynamics, um, by all of the stuff that happens during conflict, including how non-state actors behave, how taxation uh, takes place, legitimacy, etc. All of that is obviously going to influence the implementation uh, of a peace accord and all of the stuff that happens in a post-conflict setting. 
again, I think it's pretty fair to say uh, that we know very little right, about how the implementation phase of a peace accord, a peace process, actually influences, uh, mediates, or whatever, uh, these, these, uh, these uh, processes. And I think these papers take us uh, in a very fruitful direction in, in, in fleshing out uh, some of that. I think connected to that, it's uh, something that was, to some extent, between the lines here, but it's the question of how the conflict in itself, right, creates new uh, winners and losers, right? So, uh, very broadly speaking, right, so in a pre-conflict uh, society, you had a set of political elites, you had a set of quote-unquote winners and losers. The conflict in itself is going to reconfigure that, and when you come out of the conflict, who are the, uh, who's on top and who's on, on the bottom of society very often has changed, and that is also going to influence uh, the post-conflict settings, and it's going to be influenced to a large extent by the types of activities that these, uh, this project is basically delving into. And to understand that further, uh, delve further into that, elaborate on that, is, has obvious uh, policy, uh, policy implications. What I would wish for, what I would want, uh, want to see more of uh, from a policy perspective, right, is for all of you to flesh out some of these mechanisms much more, right? Uh, because it's the mechanisms very often where no, I can actually do something. So to understand those, understand how they how they behave, how they affect or whatever, how a mechanism works, is is I think would be extremely useful. And then, um, you know, especially in 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 uh, in, um, in Santiago's presentation, uh, we also had the, the the climate dimension come in really really you know nicely slash uh, depressingly. I have this this. Uh, uh, this uh, favorite map of mine where uh, uh, you've had, uh, I think it's the University of Notre Dame that has this index of uh, climate vulnerability, right? So there's basically a map showing the climate vulnerable countries. Surprise, surprise, that's not the same countries as the countries creating the climate change. It's the exact opposite uh, of, of those countries. And then, um, I can't remember who did it, but someone simply took that index and overlaid it uh, with, uh, with uh, conflict and fragility. Not to say, right, that there's necessarily a, a causal effect between them, that, you know, a, a different kind of discussion, but just to say that geographically, uh, the overlap is immense, right? So there, so, and that goes back to this question that we, or the point that we started on with the, uh, the the proportion of extremely poor that's going to live in fragile and conflict settings in the years to come. These are the same settings, the same countries that are the most vulnerable to, um, to um, climate change. So, and, and again then, then you have this very nice discussion in Santiago's papers on, on, on how conflict actually uh, affects uh, um, all of these climate issues, which makes it even more important, right, to, to integrate that and to understand the mechanisms uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, um, how all of that works. Um, um, uh, so I, I think there's only one thing, right, uh, where, so I, you know, broadly speaking, generally, uh, there's a lot of extremely fruitful and interesting research avenues here. I, I, I hope and trust that you uh, pursue it. There's obvious policy implications, but I think there's uh, probably one area where it would be nice to hear your reflections uh, on you know, how this influences stuff and where it might be really interesting to, to see a little bit more, and that is, is uh, to a varying degree, right, you focused almost exclusively, but you know, with some exceptions, on uh, the conflict actors and the state. Uh, the missing uh, ingredient or the missing link in all of this right then is the um, civilians. Obviously we know uh, that uh, uh, how, you know, how civilians behave in a conflict settings, you know, who do they support, do they withdraw support, how is that influenced by taxation, uh, that's also going to be important and interesting in all of that. I hope you integrate that going forward. It would be nice to hear some of your you know, first impressions and reflections um, on that. I think I'll leave it with that. Uh, and uh, just to reiterate, thank you for, for giving me the, the privilege of sitting here and listening to these fascinating uh, talks for an hour and a half. 
And before we, uh, or you guys address uh, Holvard's comments, I suggest we take uh, two or three more comments from the audience. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, is that okay? Uh, okay, um, co uh, questions, comments? There's one here and then one at the back. Let me. Matthias from Hau, um, from the Barcelona Institute of International Studies. I mean, this project is, is fabulous. I really like the, the overall focus on, on taxation and bringing in non-state actors. But, so I think I have two points on, on the general framing of, of the, the project. I think you, you, you do a really nice job in, in kind of looking at potential and realized tax revenues and whether it's non-state actors and state actors. But I was wondering, I would push it a little bit further. And I think for me, a crucial distinction is between a scenario where you have, which you might call tax addition, yeah, where the rebel group layers additional taxes on top of yeah, what the government collects, or you have a, um, a situation of tax substitution, yeah, where basically the IRG tax taxes are outcrowded yeah, by, the, by the rebels' tax efforts. And I think sort of under what conditions do you get one or the other? And I think this is an important, and then what do they mean? Yeah, what are the consequences yeah, for the duration of conflict, for the kind of post-conflict settlement you get? So I think, yeah, so this is more like stream of thought um, suggestions. And I think, yeah, I leave it at that. Thank you so much for excellent question. And Hello. Uh, thanks for great presentations and uh, and really great food of uh, thought. Uh, my name is Pia Rattenhuber. I work at UniWider and I work in the tax benefit micro simulation area. For those who have never heard of this before, <laughs> basically what we do is um, we go um, and with partners in the countries and we build like a huge calculator for the government to understand what are the taxes um, that. Um, household has to pay and what are the transfers they might receive. Um, now, we use representative surveys for that purpose. And when I listened now to you, um, my head was breaking and I, I see a few microsim colleagues here and I heard their heads breaking like, how, how can we think even of incorporating some of the things that you brought up? Because obviously this is becoming more and more central. Now, um, this is a comment slash question to you guys because uh, you know what the standard surveys have and how little they have and both, all these papers here had specific data collection. One thought that came to my mind though was that um, the standard surveys that we need to simulate on, um, they have their weaknesses, but something we already do in a standard way is often to say, our results have caveats, for example, in terms of informality. We can't, we can give maybe a corridor, but we can't often say exactly what the informality will do to the tax revenues on personal income tax. What is kind of the disclaimer that you guys think or would recommend that we start thinking about in terms of conflict? Like, if you would introduce this or that tax, what is the disclaimer I should then give the policymaker in his hands to say, hey, if you introduce this and that, hey, there's that conflict, maybe only in that part of your country, but what would that do to this social contract at the state level? But what could also be the dangers in terms of making maybe the conflict stronger or whatever? So I'm kind of going in terms of a little bit what Howard said before, what are the takeaways for policy and, and very technical in my uh, area, what, what should we also think about in our models? Maybe we can incorporate some of it, um, but also what is when we come up with a recommendation or a result in terms of policy in the end, where should we really highlight caveats that we haven't thought about yet? Thank you. Thank you so much, Pia. Um, anyone else? We have time to fit in one more question? No? Okay, if not, uh, then I suggest let's go in reverse order. <laughs> Anna, why don't you start? And then Santiago. And okay, thank you. Um, so actually, I see... Um, Okay, wait, you had asked something, and let me just remember. 
um, oh, how civilians are affected. Well, so, the, so I think these two questions are related. I'll come to that in a moment. I think that uh, maybe my, my co-panelists have more to say on the details of, of civilians and taxes. I'll say that the, the work that I'm doing on Yemen is not on taxation right now, but it, it looks at its household survey um, data that comes from the World Food Program and looks specifically at food insecurity and food access. And so my co-author who's at the World Bank and I are looking at you know, displacement and kind of decision making during conflict. And I think that, you know, we we don't have data in, in that data set on um, taxes and things, but we have a lot of data, uh, a lot, but, you know, limited data, as, as you were mentioning in conflict zones, um, but on basic services and those sort of things. And so there is some, I think, I've been talking to him a little bit about maybe we can do something with not necessarily the taxation part, but a different, a different, you know, looking at the different territories people are um, under and what we know about kind of different tax regimes that they're living under and how that relates to some of the services. So there's, I think there's some work that's under, uh, that, that's possible in like the context of Yemen, for example, that looks a little bit more at the um, at household well-being, um, these two uh, qu questions and, and comments I think are are quite related in the sense that um, first, yes, the um, the the tax addition actually I, I went through it quickly, but the Yemen example there of the tax receipt is actually a government tax receipt that the Houthis took and put their fifty percent additional. It's called a completion um, of of their taxes, and so. The, the, they take those government receipts, they add 50% to it, and they take that 50%. And so that is definitely something we're, we're thinking about. This, this framework was just the beginning. The idea would be to incorporate um, different sectors into this and to think about for a specific country, you know, what new, what, what the revenue structure actually is for the government uh, to the extent that we can figure that out for the, the, the non-state actors as well and then the different sources of um, expenditure that we, that we again have to get a bunch of these different data and you were asking um, uh, about, about these different data sources. Um, I think that, again, my colleagues will speak more to that in terms of going on the field. My, my colleague, um, Zach um, Memphili, has done a lot of field work to, to be able to get those sort of data. Um, and I think that, you, you know, you mentioned the duration of the conflict as being critical here. And I think this links very well to your question about how should the state and, you know, how should the UN when we're in other organizations when they're working with the state be thinking of of describing things like you know this new taxes or whatever may, may be to get in can buy in, um, and I think that what's what's kind of critical here is not just tax policy but but whatever policies there are you know as an economist thinking about the the costs and benefits from the government perspective as well as from you know the civilian perspective and and I think what a real um, shortcoming is in in a lot of the economics literature that I've, I've seen is, is again, like things that we can't measure, we, we don't necessarily, we, we try and make some assumptions and we kind of focus on, on the other areas. And so um, I, I don't have any particular uh, examples uh, to give you except the, that in, in studying corruption and, and other sort of you know, illegal transactions, there, there are many uh, indirect ways of, of doing survey questionnaires and, and you know, at a, at a broader kind of or higher level. Um, but I think that these are, these are really linked and I guess again I want to emphasize the importance of incorporating this. We have a lot of new growing micro evidence, right? And I think that what, what Zach and I are trying to do is first think of the conceptual framework to, to say what we should be looking at and then we need to think about how to get the micro evidence underneath to, to start bolstering bolstering our um, body of evidence. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Patricia. Um, so thanks for all the reactions and questions. I'm going to try to organize my ideas. Um, first, like the easiest one is, I think your point is uh, uh, very important on trying to look at like, for instance, geographical patterns and how these things correlate. So for sure we're doing that. Um, your second point on what about civilians? I think that links to your question also about tax substitution. Um, and here I'm going to refer not only to this project, because this, this project we're still like, there's, there's one piece of information that's very hard to collect, which is for instance like illegal taxation or extortion, right? Because what we have in, in, in many parts of the country is extortion reports, which as I told you are completely underreported. So it's hard to get conclusions out of that. Uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, like a close project, we're also collecting data, for instance, in Medellin, uh, so it's a very like focused and like in-depth kind of uh, uh, concentrated work. 
uh, that's not mostly related to, conf to conflict, but mo more now to like criminal rule or criminal governance. Uh, and this is one point I want to make. I think like as, as the world become, as is becoming more urban, I think like uh, rebel rule is becoming also more like kind of criminal rule because also like these like exclusively ideologically motivated conflicts are more scarce. Like now you, we see in Colombia like like the FARC, I don't know, a third of the FARC demobilized and the rest just remained being a criminal organization. Uh, a quarter of the paramilitaries demobilized and the rest remained being criminal organizations that are all dedicated only to illicit rents such as cocaine production or illegal mining and many other activities. And what we see also in cities is that criminal gangs engage in more, pretty much the same type of activities. They provide services in exchange for some taxes that in some cases civilians interpret as a tax, in some others as a payment for a service, and in some others as a just an outright extortion. And I think that getting at this, like the details of this is very important. And, and we're working on this, in Medellin we're running this service where we, for instance, ask about who provides some services. And we, and we see a lot of, not even substitution, but complementarities. Like people says, yeah, for these kind of things I call the police, for this other type of, type of things I call the criminal gang that controls the neighborhood. Or I, I first call the police, if they don't show up, they then call the other. Uh, and this is just like a, kind of a very stable duopoly in many neighborhoods. We're focusing on Medellin, but we're seeing the same patterns in Rio de Janeiro, for instance, in Central America and some parts. So I think there's a lot to, to study here about this interaction at the very local level that involves civilians, their opinions, whether they see legitimacy in any of these actors, uh, and how these actors behave in providing these services. Um, and I think that to do that, and this goes back to uh, Pia's question on I think we need to do a lot of qualitative work. Because, uh, and, and I think that in the conflict like agenda, this has been done a lot. But in the more criminal rule agenda, this has been done fewer. And, and I think we need to do more. We need to interview more members of criminal organizations to understand their motives. Uh, and I think that this is a, a, like a, an important like tipping point in, in research in economics that political science already like went through it. Uh, because in, in economics it's kind of, sometimes the incentives are not aligned, so you need like clean identification and like perfect data, as you were saying, to publish a good paper. But doing like research in criminal organizations now is like how people was, was doing, were doing research in I.O. in 1910. There was no, no like manufacturing survey to like run regressions, right? So you need to just go and get the data by yourself. and. It's going to be like a selected samples. It's going to be probably just going to be measurement error massive, but we, we do need to do a lot of that. Um, and yeah, and I, think, and I think that links to the last point on how to incorporate like all these into these models. I think we need to do more of these. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, yes, uh, so on the, on the role of civilians, I think, um, you know, there's, there's the pitfalls of the state-centric approach, there's also the pitfalls of the rebel-centric approach, and the civilians do play an extremely important role, but I think some, some of the rebel governance literature has really paid attention to the role of civilians, the work of Zakaria, uh, the work of Ana Arjona as well. Um, but, so, so, civilian agency is extremely important in these zones, and I would say even more than civilian agency per se, the role of non-state civilian authorities, be they uh, customary authorities, religious authorities, or authorities that emerge ad hoc in these zones, and often have to negotiate very complex situations between government forces, rebel forces and the range of actors that are there. And they are the ones doing these very complex negotiations, usually um, you know, managing localized uh, peace deal or arrangements on the provision of public services. And I would really say that those would be, you know, in terms of policy, some of the main entry points into these zones that are very complex and where it's not just the rebels and government forces, but you know, these, these uh, these types of authorities, civilian authorities in those areas that uh, play a very important role. Um, in terms of these you know, taxation dy dynamics, I think uh, geography is quite important. Uh, what you, you know, to, to really simplify what you typically have geographically is 
uh, larger cities where there are government forces, where there are state services and all that, and where you know the state functions as more or less normal, uh, although there are criminal groups in the larger cities. Um, I'm talking about conflict zones here. Then you have like the extreme opposite, which is which is um, rebel-held, completely rebel-held areas, especially their strongholds. For example, the MILF uh, in the Philippines called these camps, which are actually military camps, but also sets of village with villages which they run, govern, and tax. But a very important part is the in-between. Uh, so those zones that are in-between, where there is both, uh, let's say, state taxation and state presence, but also this covert presence of these uh, rebel uh, groups, uh, rebel organizations or armed groups. This is the case of the fishing communities uh, that I was talking about in the Zamboanga Peninsula. It's also the case, for example, that schools that we studied uh, on another project in South Kivu, uh, where, which are officially under, let's say, state rule, but at night are being taxed and harassed by the armed groups. And uh, those typically will have to pay the double tax burden. And those, you know, in between zones, uh, which are often, you know, delimited also geographically are important to take into account, but also within the cities, this, you know, covert criminal govern governance that operates and also, you know, lo uh, levies a, a double tax. And just to finish, I think, you know, the disclaimer um, with regards to, to policy, I think I would say would be that assumptions don't hold uh, in these zones. Uh, you know, states' legitimacy should not be taken as a given. Uh, the fact that people would want to uh, comply to taxation and comply to, you know, state rule is in contestation historically and also uh, in present times. And thus, you know, donors and people who are going to work in these zones, various organizations, you need to, you know, develop conceptual apparatuses to understand them. Uh, there are already tools that exist, you know, conflict assessments and these types of things, but then the larger programs often rely on assumptions that don't necessarily hold, so there should be different sets of assumptions that, that are deployed there. Thanks. Uh, just, just to add one more thing. I think also, like, because in some of the surveys that we've run, we, we see that people tend to believe that the tax that's collected by the criminal group is actually kind of fair relative to what the state collects. And I think that there's a lot to do also with, like, designing, like, progressive taxing systems, like in, 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 in developing countries, we see like these massive heavy bureaucracies to actually create a formal business. Then you have to pay a lot of taxes. And the alternative is someone that provides protection, maybe some services, maybe in a coercive way that damages you, but maybe not. Uh, and it's, it's often not as, as expensive as, as, the, as the state. So I think that also, like, we need to think about like, how to design like, effective and, and like, clean like, taxing. And I, I come from a country that has like, a tax reform every year. Uh, and it's just like, a, it's completely, I mean, it's completely not, not technical. Indeed. So, um, I think we between these people and lunch. <laughs> so, I will then uh, call the end of the session. Thank you very much. And thank you for your comments, Halvard, and thank you for everyone.